Hello and welcome to Mariology. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. My friends, we are in the section of the course that deals with authentic Marian dogma. And I just want to re-emphasize that these are not dry, abstract theological principles. These are truths about your mother and my mother, the mother of Jesus and the mother of all peoples, that helps us to know who she is. And the more we know who she is, the better we can love her and the better we can tap her maternal intercession for ourselves, for the need of the church, for the needs of the world. So this is absolutely relevant to our daily life in the life of the church, the life of the world, because God has willed that Our Lady have a key role in the salvation of humanity, always, once again, secondary and subordinate to our, our sweet Lord, our, our divine Savior, the most sacred heart of Jesus and his Eucharistic heart. But the sacred heart of Jesus wants the Immaculate Heart of Mary involved. Uh, and because it's the plan of, of, of God the Father from all time, that Mary was predestined in the Catholic understanding of that word, she was planned to be the woman with the Redeemer, the mother of God, uh, the human co-redemptrix, the mediatrix of all graces. And we'll talk about these doctrinal themes as well after we get through the dogmas of Our Lady. So just to emphasize again, we will in today's lecture be talking about Our Lady's perpetual virginity. And why one might be tempted to say, well, okay, well, but why is that so irrelevant? Because as we'll see, it's Mary's perpetual virginity that protects the incarnation, as Cardinal Ratzinger said in his famous work, The Ratzinger Report, uh, and it guarantees that Jesus uh, is of a divine nature, it certainly safeguards that truth, but also that Mary is the greatest disciple of our Lord in imitation of his life, which include, includes a, a life of virginity. Uh, you know, Pope St. John Paul II, uh, in his Theology of the Body, talks so beautifully about virginity, not as the negation of sexuality, but as the champion of sexuality in the sense that the, the, the virgin sees the value of the body, the sexual value of the body, the nuptial, as St. John Paul II would say, the gift nature of the body, so much so that they offer it right back to our Lord. So virginity does not negate the beauty of human sexuality or the value of the body. Virginity is saying, I so value it, I want to give it back to the Father in imitation of Jesus. So with that perspective and, 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 and the beauty of virginity, which in the early church was almost synonymous with sanctity, uh, the, the, the respect for the virgin uh, and the call of virginity what was, was really beautifully attested to, not without, obviously, the uh, blessings and beauty of marriage and sexuality as well, but we've lost that in our age. We've lost any value. In fact, sadly, in a lot of uh, secular sitcoms or, or movies or cinema or social media, to have retained one's virginity uh, into their you know, uh, 20s is seen as a sign of, of social inadequacy. Well, that's a lie from hell, <laughs> straight up. Virginity is first cousin to sanctity, not exclusive, but first cousin to sanctity. And Our Lady's virginity not only safeguards the incarnation, but also manifests that she is, in fact, the greatest disciple, the greatest imitator of her divine Son, our Lord Jesus. So having said that, let's get into this second dogma. We talked, of course, about the first dogma, Mary as Mother of God, from which all these other truths come. Uh, and imagine, imagine the intimacy of being the mother of the incarnate word, both in the womb and then for his 33 years of life out of the womb and of course now for all eternity. Uh, that mother-son unity, which is so beautiful in itself, only is uh, of a supernatural, of, of anointed, uh, uh, the highest sublime nature between an immaculate mother, an immaculate human mother, 
and her divine child. Now, this second dogma, the second solemn pronouncement regarding Our Lady also happens early. So let's go to 649 and we cite Pope Martin I at the Lateran Council. Now, for those taking this in a more academic uh, sense in terms of a course, just a quick distinction. The First Lateran Council was not an ecumenical council. It was a local or regional council. And therefore, you, you would not hold that you can get a dogmatic statement out of a local council, but the findings of the Lateran Council pertinent to Our Lady's perfect and perpetual virginity was confirmed at Third Constantinople, which was an ecumenical council in 681. So it therefore does have a dogmatic status to it. So what does Pope Martin I say in this Lateran Council? What does he decree? He decrees that Mary is virginal in three key aspects. Number one, she is virginal before the birth of Jesus. Number two, she's virginal during the birth of Jesus. And this second aspect we have to explore because it's an essential part of the dogma. And number three, that Mary is virginal after the birth of Jesus. So before, during, and after the birth of Jesus. That's why it's sometimes called the threefold virginity of Our Lady, or in a summation statement, the perpetual virginity of Our Lady. Now let's examine these three aspects of Mary's virginity once again in the sources of Revelation. And of course, let's logically start with her virginity before the birth of Jesus. So we see in the Apostles' Creed that the, the Apostles' Creed says that Jesus was, quote, conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, which obviously means, A, she's conceived by God, not by man, and B, that uh, indeed Jesus is born of a virgin. Now, let's go to Scripture. Let's start with Isaiah 7.14. Uh, Isaiah 7.14, you hopefully will recall from our survey of Scripture, is when the prophet, uh, prophet Isaiah states that, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So this reference in Isaiah is clearly a reference to Our Lady because, of course, the God with us, the, the, the child, all Christians grant, is Jesus Christ. Now, a quick note here, and then hopefully a further emphasis uh, a little bit as we extend into Mary's virginity during the birth as well. But the word here, uh, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, the word in the Greek is parthenos. And let me give, it to, to, uh, give this to you for those who are, are more interested. So, parthenos in Greek and of course, we're talking this, the Greek Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament here, has one meaning, and one meaning only, and it's virgin. And the reason I emphasize that is during the 1970s, unfortunately, there was a theologian who said that based on the scriptural references of Mary, her virginity is an open question. Well, quite frankly, that is uh, biblically wrong. It's certainly theologically wrong and it's theologically irresponsible. Uh, what was the reason that this uh, scriptural theologian said that, who happened sadly to be Catholic? Uh, why would he make that point? Well, because in the Hebrew, the word is la halma. And his contention was, well, the Hebrew word could mean virgin or young maiden or a young woman of marriageable age who was indeed, could be married. Well, the reason that's irresponsible and, and inaccurate is, is multiform, but just for our sake, every time Alma is used, it's always in a virginal sense in the Old Testament. Secondly, the Greek makes clear that it's virgin and only virgin. Thirdly, 
what does it do to the prophecy if Isaiah is saying to King Ahaz, okay, here's a great sign, it's coming from God. Are you ready for this? A young married woman will conceive and bear a child. Well, that happens all the time. So it loses the whole sign value, let alone falling away from a proper Catholic interpretation of the text as it's held in the Traditio. And again, that's why we, at the beginning of the class, we talk about uh, a proper understanding of Scripture in light of the family from which it comes, which is the church. So, for all these reasons, it is appropriate to see in Isaiah, and again, we're talking about Isaiah 7.14, right? That it is reference to a virgin. Now, I'll mention this here. We'll apply it in, uh, a little bit later. Notice that there's two verbs in this great prophecy. That a virgin will A, conceive, and B, bear a child. Well, many of the fathers of the church saw that second reference about a virginal bearing as being supportive of Mary's virginity during the birth of Jesus as well. We'll talk about that momentarily. So let's go to the New Testament. In the New Testament, in Luke 1, 27, leading into 128, and of course, the, the passage of the Annunciation, uh, Scripture says that the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a virgin, and later, in that same uh, verse 27, that the virgin's name was Mary. So, there's no question that Luke 1 is fulfilling Isaiah 7, 14, and that it is indeed a virgin, uh, that Our Lady is a virgin. Now, why is it so important? Well, first of all, uh, again, as Cardinal Ratzinger says, all the Marian dogmas are protecting the truth about Jesus. So Mary's virginity before the birth is assuring that Jesus is of divine origin. This is not of human seed. This is of the Holy Spirit, conceived of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in terms of the uh, uh, acceptance by tradition, it's, it's simply unanimous uh, with Ignatius of Antioch and Justin and Irenaeus and Clement uh, going up through the uh, from the first century to the second century through the third century. This is, obviously, as we know, uh, this is accepted by the general body of Christians uh, without much uh, debate in, or challenge with this. Now, let's go to the second aspect of her virginity. What does it mean to say Mary was virginal during the birth of Christ? Let's note, first of all, that that's not an arbitrary part of the dogma, uh, both as declared by Martin I at the First Lateran Council and then confirmed by Third Constant Constantinople in 681 uh, as an ecumenical council. So it's not, you can't go from virginity before the birth to virginity after the birth and forget virginity during the birth. So, what does that mean? What does that defined aspect of her virginity mean? It means, as the fathers of the church summarized, that at the appointed time, Jesus left the womb of Mary without any physical violation to Mary's physical virginity. The fathers of the church concluded to a miraculous birth. That is, a birth that, once again, does no violation to Mary's physical virginity. Now, I want to go through the sources of Revelation to support this aspect of the dogma, and then we'll come back and ask the why question. Why would God use a miracle to protect Mary's physical virginity? That's why the fathers of the church called it virginitas intactu, Mary's physical virginity intact throughout the process of giving birth to the Redeemer. Well, first of all, let's go back to, again, Isaiah 7, 14. And we make reference to that second verb uh, that Mary not only gave, uh, as prophesied by Isaiah, a virginal birth, but a, vir a virginal conception, excuse me, but a virginal bearing that she bore Jesus virginally. Now, in the a tradition of the church, again, you have the consensus of the fathers of the church 
that Mary indeed had what they refer to as a miraculous birth. Sometimes the image was this, uh, as, as catechetically presented. That is, light passes through glass without harming the glass, so too did Jesus pass through the womb of Mary without any harm, once again, to her physical virginity. Uh, now let's make reference to some uh, traditional, even papal quotes to this. Uh, let's go to the middle of the fifth century. This is the famous tome or letter of Saint Leo to Flavian. And in this tome, Leo says, uh, again, Pope Saint Leo says, and I quote, uh, Mary brought him forth with her virginity untouched, as with her virginity untouched she conceived him. Meaning that, again, the process of giving birth does not violate Mary's physical virginity. Uh, this is confirmed, for example, uh, by St. Thomas Aquinas. If you go to uh, Tares, the third part, question 28, uh, which is dealing with the topic of uh, Mary's virginity. St. Thomas Aquinas quotes St. Augustine saying that Christ was born by a divine power without any physical violation of Mary's virginity. So you have these two pillars of the church, both St. Augustine, who's, who's really summarizing beautifully all the fathers, the, the, the vast consensus of the fathers of the church, and then St. Thomas Aquinas, arguably the greatest theologian in the history of the church, confirming that Mary uh, gave forth a miraculous birth. And this will also uh, confirm the fact that Mary also had no labor pains, uh, as we'll talk about as well later, that because labor pains would be an indication of the fall. But her immaculate conception, as defined by Pius IX in 1854, makes clear that she was preserved from original sin and all of its effects. Well, one effect of original sin is pain and labor. Our Lady would be free from that. Uh, even more recently, Pope Pius XII, in his 1943 encyclical on the mystical body, Mystici Corpus, makes reference to the, quote, miraculous birth of Jesus Christ. Now, even more contemporary, we have Lumen Gentium number 57 of the Second Vatican Council. Lumen Gentium uses a liturgical expression purposely and says that the birth of Christ, quote, does not diminish his mother's virginal integrity, but sanctifies it. Does not diminish Mary's virginal integrity, but sanctifies it. And that same truth is taught in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 499. So it's clearly an essential part of the dogma. She's virginal before the birth of Jesus. She's also virginal during. As one a scholar uh, said, and we have to be careful of this, and I, I want to stress a, a beautiful line of Pius XII where he says, don't get overly biological when discussing the mother of God out of respect for her. And we were certainly going to follow that as well. But what else could it mean, as one author said? What else could it mean? Could it really mean that there was a need to define that there was no intercourse during the process of giving birth, well, that would be uh, so inappropriate and, and even bordering on the blasphemous that that would even be a, a conception that would need to be defined. It can only mean what the fathers in the church and what the magisterium has taken it to mean, and that is a miraculous birth. It, it doesn't diminish Mary's virginal integrity, it sanctifies it. Now, we can also use to answer the why question, the great wisdom of St. John Paul II in his Theology of the Body. As many of you are probably familiar with, the, the Theology of the Body is, a, is a, just a, terrible, a wonderfully rich uh, uh, theological anthropology. Uh, I was going to use the word terribly in the classic meaning of that. It's, it's, it's awe-inspiring. It, it's, it's, there's so much uh, profundity in it. 
And it can be kind of summarized by the expression that the body, the body expresses the person, that the external is an expression of the internal. Well, if, you, well, if we apply that principle to Our Lady's giving miraculous birth to Jesus, we can see that her physical virginity is a bodily expression of her perfect interior virginity. And that if God wanted to have one woman to be the perfect model for all later virgins to come, that it would be appropriate that she would be both internally virginal, but also physically, bodily virginal, without any breaking of her virginal seal. And again, it becomes a matter of logic as well as theology. How else can you have one woman who's going to be perfect mother and also perfect virgin unless you have a miracle that protects her physical virginity? So once again, my friends, it's an essential, it's not an arbitrary, it's not a uh, optional aspect of Our Lady's perpetual virginity. It's an essential part of the dogmatic teaching. Well, let's now go to the third aspect of Mary's virginity, uh, that which sometimes is most controversial amidst apologetics with our brother and sister Christians who are not Catholic. And that's the aspect that states that Mary is virginal after the birth of Jesus. This means two things, my friends. It means, number one, that Mary has no relations with Joseph, and it means, number two, obviously, that Mary consequently had no other children than Jesus. Now, I want to bring in at this point, too, a, a beautiful truth uh, as taught by St. Augustine, and, and again, the consensus of the fathers, and it's the idea that Mary had a vow of virginity. Now, one could say, well, how do we know? Where, where, where is that in the sources? Well, let's go to Luke 1, 34. Luke 1, 34. And this is where Mary says, in response to the invitation of the Archangel Gabriel, she says, how will this be since I know not man? How will this be since I know not man? St. Augustine wisely says, why would a woman who's in part one of marriage, which Mary was, remember we talked about that already, that part one of marriage is betrothal, but that's true marriage. Part two is when the wife is brought into the home of the husband. Why would a married woman, part one, say, how will this be, for I know not man, if she didn't have already a vow of virginity? It's the only way that her statement makes sense. Otherwise, she would assume that uh, she would have relations with Joseph. And it's also interesting that in the mystical tradition, and let me say a brief word about what I mean by the mystical tradition. The mystical tradition is if you put together all the church-approved mystical writings from saints, from blessed, uh, that convey elements of private revelation, which, by which we are not bound, but which can confirm uh, what we see in tradition, and even what's sometimes called small t tradition, that is things that are not formally defined, but things that are, are part of our uh, life and liturgy and practice, etc. The mystical tradition is also unanimous on the idea that Mary had a vow of virginity even uh, before she would enter betrothal as something that she was inspired by God to make. So St. Augustine is certainly right. The only reason that Mary's response makes sense is that she indeed had a vow of virginity, which she would have to confide to Joseph and Joseph would have to accept, uh, which of course he does in his virtue. So. This third aspect of Mary's virginity is taught from, uh, again, uh, for example, in 392, we have Pope St. Sericius. I'll spell that. Pope St. Sericius in 392, 
who teaches Mary's perpetual virginity. Now, again, my friends, we don't want to, in the 21st century, to be disagreeing, to be denying, to be parting from the truths that Christians held in the first centuries. And that's, that's, the thing, that's the closest to Jesus. That's the most proximate to the revelation given through, uh, again, apostolic tradition and then recorded in Scripture. And, and these, so th these things were clearly understood and taught. So Mary's perpetual virginity is defended from the beginning. St. Jerome is a very strong defender of Our Lady's perpetual virginity. Now, when we discuss Our Lady's perpetual virginity, three objections come up, and I want to deal with these objections rather quickly. The first objection comes from Matthew 1, verse 18, uh, and also Matthew 1, verse 25, and those are the words before and till. Uh, and this is where uh, Scripture says, and again, this is Luke 1, uh, before they came together, uh, well, excuse me, well, let's do verse 25, and he, Joseph, knew her not until she brought forth her firstborn son. And again, the earlier one is uh, Matthew 1, 18, that speaks about, quote, when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child. So what's the objection? The objection is that the words before and till demand that happens after. Quick response to that, my friends. Number one, that's simply not what the words mean, before and until, even in a dictionary, even etymologically. They simply establish what has not yet taken place. Uh, secondly, uh, in regards to these terms, there's examples in Scripture. For example, uh, in 2 Samuel 6, verse 23, Scripture reads, uh, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of death. Well, does that mean that Michael, who was uh, the, the, the daughter of Saul, had a child after death? No, the, the words simply mean what has not yet taken place. So it's not uh, both etymologically, let alone theologically, uh, appropriate to say, well, before until demand that Mary and Joseph had relations afterwards, as indeed it did not take place. Second objection, and this is the most common, and, and you, you, you want to be articulate on this just for a proper defense of Our Lady's perpetual virginity. It's the reference to the brethren of the Lord, the brothers of Jesus that we have in the Gospels. And there's several reference to the brethren of the Lord. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a reference to brothers and sisters of the Lord, too. I, I always uh, I, I wonder why for individuals who don't accept the Catholic teaching regarding Mary's perpetual virginity, they only mention the brothers. Well, if you accept that Jesus had brothers, you, if you're going to read these in a literal and in, in, a, in this sense, uh, uh, an idea outside of the tradition and even the meaning of the words, why don't you include the sisters? At any rate, how does the church understand reference to the brothers of the Lord? Well, the Greek word is adelphos. Adelphos means brother, cousin, near relative, and even kinsman. Someone from your hometown could be called an adelphos. In the Hebrew, it has, the word is ach. And this would refer to Old Testament references, right? Both, we have both the Septuagint Greek Old Testament and we have also the Hebrew, of course. Ach means exactly the same thing. Ach means brother, cousin, near relative, and even kinsman. And so, first of all, we note that the word brother in no sense is limited to blood brother. I remember having a group of uh, African priests in a, in a master's class, and we, we, when we got to this part of the lecture, they all started laughing, saying, oh my gosh, the idea that you can only use brothers for blood relation. He said, we even have, uh, we use the word mother for several women. Our blood mother, someone very close to our blood mother, can be called mother. 
Anybody else would be, any other women close to the family would be called auntie, and we call all, the, all people as brothers. Well, it's also true that Jesus says, you know, who am my, who is my mother and who are my brothers? All who do the will of God, mother, sister, brother to me. Well, that's either one very big blood family, or of course, Jesus is talking spiritually. He's talking about the kingdom of God. So there are many cases uh, when we use the word brother that we don't mean that it's strictly speaking a blood relation. Let me also mention briefly that in John 19, uh, 27, when Jesus says, 26 and 27, when Jesus says to Mary, woman, behold your son, and then behold your mother, and John took her into his own home, that if indeed Jesus had other physical brothers, let alone sisters, that would be a violation of Jewish law because the surviving brother, the surviving son, would, would have to take Mary into his home. So that would be another violation, apart from just the common sense meaning. I, I would also refer to uh, the use of the word uh, brother in the Old Testament, and I'm just going to make quick reference to this. Uh, for example, in Genesis uh, 29, 15, uh, we have reference to Jacob being referred to as the brother of Laban, but we know, of course, that in the, in the context, it's a relationship of uncle to, uh, to nephew. So this is true in scripture, it's true in life, it's true etymologically. So the reference to the brothers of Jesus in no sense uh, means that Jesus had physical brothers, but it's often seen that these were cousins of Jesus, but they could also be references to disciples of Jesus. Who are my mother and brothers? Those who do the will of God. Okay. Third reference to a possible objection to Mary's perpetual virginity is sometimes opposed that if indeed Mary and Joseph never had relations, then they were never truly married. This, my friends, would be a mistaken idea of the nature of marriage because the nature of marriage, Christian marriage, is a total gift of self to other in Christ for life as manifested in the consent. And St. Augustine is very clear about this too, that although they did not exchange bodies, they exchanged consent, which is the nature of marriage. So, all in all, Mary is virginal before, during, after the birth of Jesus. She is the perfect disciple and remember, if you want one woman to be both the mother of Jesus and the perfect example of virginity, you have to have a miracle. And we have that with Mary's virginity during the birth. Thanks so much for being with us during this session of Mariology. Once again, uh, I wish you all God's blessing and encourage you to always remember and live the words of Jesus to behold our mother. God bless.